with the internet in Paraguay, present and future. This is something that we have done in recent events in each country, and it is to uh, dis debate uh, the uh, topics that have to do with uh, the internet in the country. But um, we wanted to discuss it all together. There are no presentations, only some data. And as there are going to be no presentations, I ask you to please come closer if you're interested, because what we are going to do is to touch upon a number of topics and to recognize those who want to say something and to comment. I'm Guillermo Sicileo. I'm of the staff of LACNIC. I work in research and development. Elisa Peirano with me. She's going to uh, co-chair this session, and she's also from R&D. And what uh, we want to do is to discuss a number of topics, interconnection, the depletion of IPv4, and the adoption of IPv6, a DNS, uh, RPKI, uh, routing security, um, uh, and uh, so, We are going to start is we are going to start with what arises more interest and that is interconnection. Uh, we somebody else already mentioned that it's a landlock. Uh, they have no access uh, to uh, submarine cables. I'd like to hear the operators that are part of uh, the ecosystem of the Internet in Paraguay. I'd like to hear from you what you, what are the challenges, what are the challenges you had to overcome. I'm going to give you the floor. Marta, you are the IXP of Asuncion. We'd love you to tell us about it. Thank you, Guillermo. I'm Marta Fretes, and at present I'm working with the staff in charge of the operations of the Paraguayan IXP. That is the name that was established for the first uh, IXP. It was uh, in 2016 in the academia. And the idea was to establish a first neutral uh, point in the country. And why should we do it at a university? Well, because in my view, uh, and I say in my view because I was not there when uh, they the, in the preliminary discussions, but the idea was to be able to build an infrastructure uh, with a spirit of a collaboration and partnership, leaving us moving away from the commercial spirit. Well, as as a matter of fact, the ISPs are commercial because, but and that's not the uh, spirit of the university. However, the university um, played a key role. I don't know whether you all know that the internet uh, got to Paraguay through two institutions of uh, the academia. One was the Catholic University, Nuestra Señora de la Asunción, that was the first uh, private uh, university, and the National University of Asunción. And that is how the internet uh, landed here in Paraguay 20 years ago. And this time, too, uh, we were uh, pioneers uh, establishing this solution. And today, we see that it is, to a great extent, is a solution that helps you uh, close those uh, gaps uh, of uh, internet connection. The university sees many challenges still in uh, the uh, deployment of an IXP. Still in Paraguay, we have two. We have uh, the, uh, the IXP of Ciudad del Este. And given the results, uh, what we see now, they uh, are working for the shorter term. They are more nimble in their operations, but especially 
we see a need uh, to uh, open new IXPs in the country, and I think that that is very positive. Uh, yesterday, or day before yesterday, Biagiate uh, was uh, here, the minister of uh, the uh, uh, IT was um, discussing this. I'm not so uh, uh, aware of uh, the uh, conversation, but I, I think it's very good to promote uh, these uh, uh, opportunities for discussion. And I'd like to mention a suggestion about the regulations uh, that can be established on the IXPs. I think that it would be good to have regulations uh, uh, to consolidate and to discuss uh, the regulations, including all the stakeholders, so that we can respect the uh, governance models that you can establish at the IXPs. So I think that the growth of the IXPs, that indeed it's a visible solution, it's a tangible solution, I think it's going to be very fruitful in our country. So the thing is that we should support the IXPs without imposing, so as to speak, any regulations that would limit their uh, partnership, the, the growth uh, of, uh, with collaboration between the parties. So I, I would invite all um, the uh, ISPs here in Uruguay. I know that the ISPs are connected, so, and if they see benefits in the connection to an IXP, I'd like to tell you that this is the solution that we should aim at in the country. We are a landlocked uh, country. We have said it more than once, and this is something that we have to promote. So I'm very happy to see that we are we have a steady growth, and we should follow the example of other countries that uh, have uh, uh, advanced more. So thank you, Guillermo. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you, Marta. So you mentioned the other traffic exchange points, so I give the floor to Sandra. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sandra Farayet. I'm chair of the ICD. We had a very important initiative nationally with several member ISPs, and fortunately, uh, very significant growth. In Paraguay, we for Paraguay we provided a new vision because within a short period of time, we were able to set up this traffic exchange point. Exchange point. We already connected Brazil, Argentina, and this is something that had never happened in the past. In Paraguay, you now have 63 giga traffic. We are dreaming to have a tremendous growth. And like Marta was saying, we are together. We have a project to support one another as a country. This is very important in Paraguay. Really have to work in this direction. Thank you. So what you have just said is very important, namely that you are working together and that the two traffic exchange points somehow supplement one another. Wesley? Good afternoon, everyone. Let me add on. Those of you who don't know me, I'm Wesley Correa. I would like to add that there are important frameworks in the country's history. This is what we managed to have the first interconnection with Brazil. This is something that happened across the Paraná River. We managed to obtain an authorization to cross this cable. This was the very first connection in that direction. So far, the only interconnection that the country had was with Argentina. The bandwidth cost was expenses at the time. So the fact of managing to obtain this interconnection was the initial step so that other companies uh, and even we have opportunities for partnerships. This was not something that was going to be unilateral. So the idea was to 
have two or three companies partnering so that they could use these cables. So these cables crossed along the Puente de la Amistad, the, the La Amistad Bridge. As far as I'm aware, there are two consortiums that have the opportunity of crossing, and they have they cross this bridge de la Amistad, and this provides resilience, this provides high availability. And the wire, the cable across the river still continues to work. Now, viewed from a higher level, I'm not an operator. I'm a network operator. I provide capacity building. I'm part of the community. I have been living in Paraguay since 2018. But what I see is that many operators in Paraguay still look at their investments with a personal approach. It is quite true that the infrastructure is not infinite. We cannot uh, plant things deliberately. We have a big infrastructure. It is quite expensive. In the north of the country, we have a cooperative, the infrastructure of a cooperative. And we see four, five, or 10 fiber optics cable doing exactly the same path. So a good vision for future interconnection is that you start to have partnerships to determine where the others, in what direction the others are going, so you can do, say, together. You will save in terms of cables, in posts, in maintenance. You can spread the cost across several people, and you will achieve the objective of connecting people. So interconnection, when we look at the complete picture, allows us to have a broader picture compared to when we only focus on one single objective. So looking in one uh, to one side and the other to see what uh, other what else is doing. Competition only exists at the home of the subscriber. So don't consider the people who are next to you as competition. You have to purchase bandwidth together. Uh, if you buy 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, it's far more expensive. So with that in mind, you have a lot to grow in the sense of expanding the network in Paraguay. There are many cities that are not connected, and they do need to be connected, to become connected. So what you have just said is also interesting. Here, do you have a NOG here? You don't have a network operators group that has been set up, so maybe it would to set up one. But you do have an ISP chamber that is somewhat different, but maybe you can tell us more about that. The ASP the association in Paraguay, ASISP, is as far as Paraguay for ours as ISPs, has a history before and after ASISP. Prior to that, we had complicated periods in terms of regulations. But after we created this association, this became a milestone because this allowed us to come closer to the regulating entity, Contanatel. Today, we have uh, task forces, and we can work together with the regulators. So that is why it's important to bring together all the ISPs. This was important so that Uruguay, the, sorry, Paraguay, has now a different vision of this moment we are experiencing. Maybe it would be a good idea to have a NOG here. A NOG is a network operators group where experts in networks come together to share problems and to share solutions in many countries, this ends up being very positive. So what Wesley was referring to, no matter if the others are competition, everyone deals with the same problems, both commercially speaking and technically speaking, particularly the technical issues are common to all. So the NOGs allow operators from different ISPs or from different organizations come together, share problems, and also share solutions. Erica, you're going to 
I'm going to give the floor to you so you can tell us more about LACNOG and the activities we do at LACNOG to encourage the creation of NOGs. Good afternoon. I'm Erika Vega from LACNOG. Regarding the activities we organize at LACNOG, one of these is to invite you to join, to get together as network operators, uh, internet service providers, for people from the universities, uh, so traffic exchange points you might have. So the idea is that you get together to let us know and to generate joint activities and also so that you can get together and exchange your experiences. This is also to share the experiences and needs you have as a country, things that we can hear from you. And from LACNOG, we are here to contribute with capacity building, with technical capacity building. This is, for example, internet operations, adoption of protocols, of mechanisms. We have different task forces that are focused on different topics, and each of these task forces organizes activities for the benefit of the community, for example, organizing webinars or in-person workshops in different countries. And also workshops in the context of these events we hold annually. In addition to that, we have the technical content that air, the, the, the work proposed by the community and that incorporated into the program of this event. Yesterday, we had the first session. And we also, at LACNOC, we help you connect with the other internet service providers in the different countries. Or also when we have people, for example, in Paraguay, we have Wesley, who is uh, or a nun, who are people you can get in touch with so that you learn more about us and the ca activities you carry out. In the case of Colombia, for example, I'm from Colombia myself. In the case of Colombia, we managed to create the network operators group in Colombia during the event that took place there in Cali in 2022. So thanks to a meeting such as this that was organized during that meeting, a small group of service providers got together. They participated at that meeting. They established contact with one another. So now we have a group that has been set up. We have a website where which will list, assist them in setting up. They have become more organized. So this has allowed us as LACNOG to organize in-person workshops with them. They organize themselves. They let us know which are the topics where they wish to have capacity building on. So we go there and provide these activities, these workshops for them in Colombia. So it is important that you're aware that we have organizations such as these that can support you. All the activities we organize are free of any cost. The idea is that we would like to know what your needs are, but also it would be great if you could organize, set up an organization such as uh, we have as a NOG. Yes, precisely. LACNIC, uh, uh, LACNIC and LACNOG have support programs for the NOGs. And like Erika was saying, it is important that a NOG is set up in the country. So the only thing we can do is to provide support to you, but you are the ones who have to lead this. There have to be individuals from the community who lead the creation of NOG. This is just a group of people who get together. You don't need to have any legal status. Sometimes if you do have a legal status, this also is helpful for hiring uh, equipment or services. But 
you need to just have a group that gets together. You can convene meetings and organize activities. Most of the NOGs have a mailing list or a WhatsApp group or a Telegram group. So with that only and setting up communities such as those, you can organize meetings. Like Erica was saying, in Colombia, this has been most positive. We have already organized large workshops with more than 60 to 100 persons with a lot of participation where we discussed many of the things that we have seen here too. For example, BGP, routing, DNS, and topics such as those. But that is for the network operators specifically. So this is something that we invite you to do, to meet, to set up a NOG. This will be great for you, and it will also be great for us, because then we can focus the capacity building activities and the messages we wish to share to just one single group. I don't know whether anybody has any comments about these interconnection topics that we are discussing, raise your hands, uh, ask for the mic. Uh, we do not intend this uh, to be a one-way uh, dialogue. We want to hear you, because you are the, uh, uh, the key stakeholders of the Internet in Paraguay. We want to hear the good things and the bad things and see how we can find solutions and support you. I'm sure that uh, well, those that operate networks, one of the problems that you may have is IPv4. Would you like to, to speak? Uh, hello, good afternoon. Jen Morales of Guatemala. I wanted to talk about my personal experience in Guatemala. The, the most complicated part, in a way, is uh, that people people should have the feeling of uh, belonging to a community. So no longer thinking in terms of uh, my competitors, because well the the we we shouldn't compete among uh, operators. But it also depends on how mature you are. Because I I see, for instance, that in Europe, in the United States. It's not an issue whether I connect uh, with the IXP or the PID. They, they, they quite accept that it's a necessary thing, but the operators always think, well, I'm going to connect because I'm going to save. But that's not the real purpose. The, uh, the raison d'etre of, uh, of an IXP is to improve uh, the uh, user's uh, experience and its quality. And what's even more than that, resilience, because what happens? Because imagine, well, in an extreme case, let's imagine that all the international fibers that feed Paraguay uh, are, uh, uh, go out of order. If there is no interaction between the XPs, there is no digital economy. So they can't communicate with the banks. That you, you can have a no transactions or certifications of universities. You cannot do bank transfers, nothing. So the key raison d'etre, uh, well, in addition to cost, is resilience and improving the user's experience. And then we see other interesting things, because when you have an, a, a, a good uh, bandwidth, and uh, uh, then it makes sense to have other business, for instance, local data centers, and not uh, to take everything to Amazon Web uh, Services of 500 milliseconds or something like that, because that's it's not uh, good. The uh, cloud in our countries, from the point of view of bringing things uh, from Europe, the United States, or the United States, it's never going to work well because of the delay and the bandwidth. In the United States, a company may. Uh, higher, one giga for 200, 300 dollars or less, and basically they have the cloud or the data center just by their network. But in Paraguay, who's going to hire a giga to uh, upload um, uh, backups to Amazon uh, Web Services? Nobody, because it's too expensive. But if all the operators are connected and there's a data center with storage, there 
the cloud makes sense. So another interesting uh, thing of the IXPs is that they enhance the country's digital economy. They create new business opportunities for companies, in this case, uh, Paraguayan or Brazilian or from wherever. And they create an, a new ecosystem for uh, apps and uh, services that is very, very important for the economic development of the countries. So, of course, we need to speak the language of the operators that you say, cause, cause whether you do that or not. But once the operators realize um, uh, the importance of a user's uh, quality of service and uh, their experience and the cost, the, well, cost uh, is second, uh, comes second. I, I was with one of the members in an office, uh, and uh, then a truck crashed against a, a pole, and uh, the connection uh, crashed. So all of a sudden, they started to receive, the NOG started receiving calls. And they were not complaining about the lack of service, but that it was slow, because the users were used to one millisecond. And when instead of that millisecond that we're used to, they connected to the YouTube in the United States to 80 or more milliseconds, people felt it. And it is that most users, of course, know nothing about networks, and they mistake uh, speed with uh, loading time. And so if we wait, expect uh, the, the users to have a better experience, let's give them what they need, uh, lower uh, loading time. And, and then you have resilience. And the, the potential for a uh, digital economy. These are issues that we have to meditate and uh, convince uh, the operators to go beyond just 10 uh, or 15 cents more or less in the price. Thank you. Well, you mentioned a couple of things that are very good. Now, what um, um, what you said about uh, resilience and the data center and uh, the internet uh, gradually displaces uh, the contents to the borders and uh, well have is solving that makes it easier for cdns and other content providers to uh, settle there and the, the other thing that you mentioned was the possibility of having the network operating even when you do not have the international connectivity. And in a while, we are going to talk about the DNS servers and uh, other things like that. Neri Machado, I am an ISP in Paraguay. I think that the conditions in general are given in Paraguay. The advantage is that we are a small country. We know each other, and if we don't know each other, we know somebody who knows the other operator. So it's a, a more official structure uh, of a, a network uh, operator center would be helpful because the conditions are there in general. There are some operators that are re reluctant to be part of a community. However, I see that people in general are willing to do that. My colleagues, I think that my, my colleagues would willingly do that. And I think that meetings like this can help you illustrate the advantages of operating as a community and even to connect with each other. Because in the end, that is uh, good for our users, people who in the end uh, are our goal. Uh, and so in Paraguay, we have that advantage, as Wesley, I don't know how Wesley sees it, but I think that we are close to working as a community. We just want to try a bit harder. Uh, and this is quite possible in Paraguay because people are prone to that. People are willing. Of course, there are, will always be people that will be reluctant. But I think that uh, we, we can work as a community. All right, to create a node, actually, what you need is a group of people 
that uh, agree to lead uh, the activities and start uh, sharing uh, either in a WhatsApp group or a, a mail list. Uh, we prefer the mailing list, but maybe people um, love other, uh, prefer other formats. And the way we start in general is through a list where people register. Uh, people join the group, and some people start sending information that will be useful to all. Uh, no ads, no, uh, not uh, promoting any sa sales. It needs to be a technical thing. For instance, if you're going to organize an event that is open, then yes, of course, you can invite the rest. Now, once the group is created, you can hold more specific activities and you'll have our support of LACNOG and other uh, organizations as ICON. NICO is not here now, but, well, DNS uh, issues and that sort of thing. We can support you both online or in person. So mostly that is what you need to have a more active community that at least will keep uh, up to date in the list and see the information that is being uh, shared and uh, and uh, attend uh, the activities. For instance, if an organization lends you a room, you can hold the activity there very often from LACNIC, for instance, or the other organizations, we can give you support to, for instance, funding a lunch or a coffee break at least. and hold that activity and if that starts to occur more regularly it's good for people to get to know each other you you can see that at these meetings you start to know uh, many people and then afterwards uh, it's not the same when you know them personally as uh, or through other means when you know them outside from uh, work it's, it's so much easier. That is basically what a node does, much more than that. And it live, makes life easier for us because we can go to one single place and train people. So uh, if you have two IXPs, you have that support because you have the IXP plus the operators, the members of the IXP that you assume that will be part of that node because they are in network operators. So it's a matter of finding who can lead that and uh, put together a mailing list or a WhatsApp group and start to working. So, but, but I think it would be a good initiative. Con lo que decía Iván, que me quedé, es con el tema ese de, de de los data centers y las nuevas posibilidades de negocio. Y una cosa que surge es cuando, cuando hay XPs que por ahí son más chicos, quizás las CDNs más grandes, las, los, los proveedores de contenido más grandes, no se instalan ahí, pero hay otras, eh, otras redes de contenido que, que sí y que, que están más dispuestos a instalarse y que son, son importantes porque a pesar de que no son ni Google, ni Facebook, ni no sé, ni las más grandes, eh, sí empiezan a, a tener eh, los usuarios tener mejor con, mejor acceso al contenido por ejemplo plataformas de gamers no entonces este ya los usuarios que los de los ISP conectados al, a los puntos de intercambio van a ver una mejora en, en lo que hacen hoy en día el, tem, el tema de los juegos en línea es uno de los eh, de, de las cosas más usadas ¿no? y entonces ellos ya empiezan a ver mejoras en, en, en su latencia, sobre todo. ¿no? Esto que, que decía Iván, de cómo percibieron la caída de la conexión al IXP y, y como un, una pérdida de, de, de las mejoras en la latencia, que ya estaban acostumbrados a una latencia muy baja y al ir por Internet empezaron a sufrir latencias más grandes. Bueno, eso es algo que también, eh, al estar interconectados y tener la posibilidad de tener contenido local, mejora mucho. Y en cuanto a DNS, eh, es otro de los puntos, y ahí este, bueno, también te voy a dar la palabra, Marta, porque ustedes administran también el, el NIC, ¿no? Sí, también, también estamos operando. Bueno, mmm, 
Actualmente en, en Paraguay sobre punto .pi hay alrededor de 30.000 dominios delegados uh, y un aspecto que de alguna forma nosotros observamos y quisiera aprovechar para impulsar es la adopción de DNSSEC. Um, nosotros eh, por estadísticas que solemos ver desde, desde lo que publica APINIC. Regarding the signing of the authoritative addresses is one of the points that we look into. Today we see the domains that have already consigned the DNS keys to the register. This is less than 2%. So this is something that we have to deal with urgently from the internet providers, from the state organizations, and the academia, and all the other authors. Because maybe we only start to adopt these best practices in a reactive way, and the registry does capacity building. And happily, a few weeks ago, we had presentations where a financial enterprise stated its interest. So we're now doing follow-up to the process of signing. This doesn't involve a major investment in terms of infrastructure. This is more guiding them, and this is what we do, and this is like organizations such as ICANN and LACNIC do so on a regular basis in Paraguay because I'm well aware that they do provide capacity building to the organizations. So we have to understand that DNSSEC is important. DNSSEC is necessary. So basically, that is one of the concerns we have. And the registry is 100% available to follow up the adoption of that practice. I wouldn't describe this as a best practice, but rather as a necessary practice for installing DNSSEC in your authoritative zones. Gracias. Um, en lo que respecta a la infraestructura de DNS, una cosa con la que podemos apoyar. Regarding DNS, one of the things that we could provide support on, both LACNIC and ICANN, is setting up root servers, root DNS servers, you're aware that any transaction in the internet begins with a DNS query. With that aim, you first have to follow all the DNS resolution tree, then we do queries to the root servers, then to the local zones, and so on. So once again, one of the things that lows, lowers the criticality of the internet resources precisely is to have any cast copies of DNS root servers. If these international links are interrupted, as we heard today, if we have, if we don't have any root server nearby, we won't be able to do anything. Although, despite being interconnected and despite everything being working locally, so we'll be able to answer any DNS query and we would have internet. But if we, in the IXP, we are connected with the PI domains and the NIC and the root server, then we will have the opportunity, if we do wish to do a DNS resolution, we'll be able to do a query to the DNS root server and then the PY in order to solve the zones and having internet locally that works. So that is very important. So uh, from LACNIC and from ICANN, we can provide support to the NIC and the IXPs and the major operators. Very often, ICANN can put root servers in operators, ICANN prefers not to set up the NIC. But there are other operators that prefer to install these in IXPs. So in that case, we can help you out with the contacts. 
We can also put copies. I think you do have one of our servers. Sandro, you, do, do, you don't, do you? Or do you? Um, please ask the person to use the microphone. But LACNUC also has the reverse DNS zones that we can include in the IXP. So having said that, well, here we have a map where I cannot read the colors from where I am, but Eli, you can pick up from here. Yes, this is the portal we prepared for measurements to centralize the information that we think is of interest on several aspects of the internet in the countries. And this is one on the DNS. You have one with the response times of the lag TLD, and next to that, the response time to the root servers. There are many colors for the very different servers. These are interactive graphs, and you can see those that are below 50, for example. H, J, F, I, D, and E. E is the one that has the least time. Then we have DNSSEC validation and the resolvers DNSs. The percentage of the DNS resolvers. The DNS resolvers graph shows the operators, what DNS resolver they give to the users. And this is good because more than 80% delivers their own server. And some of these are delivering the public resolvers. Normally, operators, when a user connects, they say the IP addresses of the DNS that the user will be applying to resolve this. So majority uses a local DNS server with the operator. Others deliver Google or other options. We also have, let's go first to the IPv6 section, IPv6 adoption. In the graph, you can see in red the adoption for the region, the average, and in blue for Paraguay, which is above that average for the region. And below that, we have the main ASMs they have and the percentage of V6 capable that they have. This table shows the operators and the autonomous systems that sometimes have the names from other countries. These are the autonomous systems that adopted IPv6. And these have been organized by size and number of end users. So Telecel, Nucleo, Amex, which is from Argentina, Tectel, and the other one is Flytech Telecom. These are the ones that have the largest share of adoption. Nucleo has 70 percent. Teltec has 51 percent. And what I showed in the other graph is not bad, but there is room for improvement. As a country, they are above the regional average, but this is 34 percent, which can be further improved, quite obviously. Today, the path forward is with IPv6, and I think enough has been said about the problems of IPv4 
nowadays. So I don't need to state again that operators should adopt more IPv6 and more regarding the end users. Here we don't have the deployment of end users. Most of the operators in the, have in IPv6 in their networks, but haven't extended this to the user's network. I would like to make a brief comment, and I apologize because I'm seated over here. My back hurts a bit. I'm getting old. But anyway, this is a comment I wanted to make on this graph. Although this is the adoption for the region, this shouldn't discourage that or encourage us. We shouldn't feel that we are doing better than other countries. Let us remember the number of inhabitants we have in Paraguay. So this graph represents that from all the internet users in Paraguay, we only have 34% who use IPv6, only. And because this is a small country, we should be way more advanced, particularly taking to have that we have major operators. Of course, some of them are not here. I think none of them is here. And they're not doing their homework properly. There are major companies that we didn't mention who don't deliver IPv6 to their users. They haven't done so. And they have a major market share of internet to the home. So there's a lot of work to be done here. And I am at your disposal in case you need assistance or clarify any questions. I will be in until the end of the week today, the, the end of the week. So if you need any assistance, please get in touch with me. Yes, that average for the region is a bit misleading because it hasn't been weighted on a country basis. Brazil, I think, has way above 40 or 50, more than 50 percent in IPv6 with millions and millions of users. So the average would be much higher. So this includes Brazil and small uh, Caribbean islands, which are not so easy to compare. And the same Euro with Uruguay, some countries are way above 40 something or 50 percent. So like Wesley was saying, this doesn't measure traffic, but rather reflects the percentage of users who are in a position to use in conditions to use IPv6 and who from their home, from their devices can have an IPv6 connection available. But that is just the percentage. It is low. So that is a point where the internet in Paraguay has room for improvement because this will also contribute to improving the user experience. At present, more and more content is available in IPv6, more and more the networks that don't have NAT, the networks that don't have any other things in between perform better, latency is lower. So this will also provide a much better user experience. So allow me to refer to the measurement probes. Many operators in Paraguay came up to our booth. We need to have in the region a measurement platform to do connectivity studies and to provide information as to the status of Paraguay in the country and how they connect with other countries of the region. So what we're looking for, in this case in Paraguay, for the operators you have here on this table, <laughs> this is a public website. If you cannot read this properly, it's report pais lacnicnet And this table over here in this table over here uh, for this we 
need, as I was saying, we need probes to do measurements in Paraguay. Some of them have contacted us already. They already have their probe, and I trust they will be setting these up and can start using these. And we also have Telesel, for example, which is the largest operator. They have a probe, and it would be great if they could have even more probes. So you can please come to our booth so we can discuss about this. And the other operators, too, in order to have the best coverage possible, so the information collected with this platform really reflects what is happening in the country. So with this information, we can do many, many things. Precisely tomorrow afternoon at 4.30, we'll have a tutorial on the use of this platform, RIPE Atlas, and how to use this to monitor your networks, to conduct measurements. So I invite you to come to that session. This will be here in this room at 4.30 p.m. So you will see how to do these measurements. At the beginning of the year, we presented a connectivity study for the region. This was using another platform because this one doesn't have coverage. But as you can see from ping, trace route, DNS measurements, so the more we can measure, the better we will determine the strengths and weaknesses of the countries and how we can improve these. And like we heard earlier, we can also improve the user experience quality. In Paraguay, they have seven probes now, which is not very much. So I invite you to come and visit us so we can discuss this topic and also so that we can improve coverage. So this is a very, very low number. I didn't think that was so small. But they're taking four more probes for Paraguay today. So you're on the right path. And the IXPs could also set up anchors which are like more sophisticated probes, and at least to measure more things. For example, the things that we see here regarding the latencies, the paths, the number of hops. So these probes, and this will see, you will see tomorrow if you come to this tutorial, but these probes not only allow us to do these measurements, but when you set up one of these probes, you have the global network of probes available, so you can use that for conducting your own measurements. You can measure from where you are outwards or incoming as well. So you can plan all the measurements you wish. You can use the ones that are available. So you needn't be you didn't have a data center to set up probes. You can install these at your home. I myself have a probe at home. And this works perfectly well. It's a little box that you can set up at home. So if you have one of these autonomous systems that Elisa showed you, Please contact us so that we can give you a probe. Uh, any comments? Any questions? Otherwise, let us go to other topics such as RPKI and manners. Are you familiar with the Manners program? This is an initiative of the community. This began as an initiative of the Internet Society, but it is an initiative of the community that has to do with secure routing and with incorporating best practices. This measures the adoption of manners in the country, so filtering is well. Anti-spoofing appears in red. I have certain doubts regarding the manners measurement platform. In the case of anti-spoofing, it refers to not allowing fake addresses 
in the IP package. So this is how you can avoid the DDoS attacks. And the case of coordination, this is low. Coordination has to do with operators registering the points of contact in databases such as Whois or Empiring DB. This is important when finding solutions to problems today when you have route hijacking or routing issues, when you have problems such as those, the way to figure out a solution to this is contacting them and sometimes calling the operators. So it is essential to have your information in a public database, as is the case of who is, or also in Peering TV. So that is what it's measuring, and uh, those numbers, that's something that should be improved. In uh, RAR, it's uh, okay, almost 100%. In RPKI, it's not uh, bad, 66% uh, adoption. So those are the issues that we wanted that the manners measures to see security and the adoption of the best uh, standards for uh, uh, network security. With regard RPKI specifically, Eighty-nine something, that's okay. This map measures the percentage of uptake of RPKI, the percentage of uh, prefixes announced uh, in BGP globally that are covered with uh, ROAS, that is, that are protected. The organization has a uh, uh, seen to it uh, that the prefixes are not hijacked. So there in uh, Paraguay, you see 89%. Bolivia, 91%. You are doing better than other countries. But some are even better. Well, but that figure is not bad at all. And, uh, well, there you don't have any data. We don't have any data uh, about IPv6. Thirty-seven of IPv6. There, there's a significant difference. The adoption of IPv6 is low, but uh, RPKI on. Uh, IPv6 is low. You have not created the ROAS. Apparently, there are many organizations that uh, have been awarded uh, uh, prefixes, but uh, have not published it or are publishing it, but are, haven't created the ROAS for uh, IPv6. And that's uh, there, so there is room for improvement there. And that's an issue, because as IPv6 uh, starts being used, there are going to be more hijacks and more uh, problems in IPv6 routes. So, and the other one is the percentage of uh, RPKIs in uh, the main autonomous systems. So, and the access of IPv6 uh, access and uh, the adoption of RPKI in IPv6. With all these topics, we can help remember that we have a campus resources uh, for IP, uh, IPv6 and access. We have a specific course for that. We have the campus courses for BGP, RPKI, and RR that are available for all uh, members. And of course,
We have uh, conducted training here at the events and we're going to do that for operators. And I think that that uh, sort of gives you a good overview. I don't know whether anybody else wants to ask about anything. And if not, uh, we'll close this and uh, we'll let you go. So you'll go to the cocktail party. Any other comments from anybody? So thank you, everybody. Let me give you some announcements before you leave. The social event will be in uh, Puerto Libre. You need to take your badges. Remember that uh, you're going to be asked to show it when as you go in. At 7.30, you'll be uh, picked at uh, the Bourbon Hotel and Sheraton 1915. So, well, you know, take the badge. 7.30, Bourbon Hotel, 7.15, Sheraton Hotel. We'll be waiting for you at 9.30. So, tomorrow we start with Lucknow. Thank you for staying with us. I hope this was uh, good for you.